Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about letting go today. And and this is an interesting topic because it seems to be uh, a challenge for most of us. And I have some quotes, so I'll start with one. Uh, You only lose what you cling to. I like that one. And I'm going to start with a story. 1978, uh, I was 29 years old. And it was a difficult year because I was about to turn 30. And that was like the worst age you could be. Now, in reading uh, the story of the Buddha, something dramatic happened to him at 29 as well. He left his family and spent six years uh, working on becoming uh, enlightened. Uh, I didn't do that. I, I quit smoking. Now, I had smoked for 14 years and found it to be very satisfying. Uh, and, and I couldn't really figure out why uh, until I stopped. It's a great habit. It satisfies uh, a lot of the things that habits satisfy. In 1978, there were 55 cents a pack. So you could really smoke a lot and not spend too much money at all. <laughs> and, and I just woke up one day and said, uh, I'm going to quit smoking. So it seemed to happen at a more subconscious level than a conscious level. But then I had to deal with the whole physical and emotional challenge of getting rid of this addiction and, and, uh, and having to kill the person that smoked in order for the person who didn't smoke to be born. So there was a lot of killing and rebirth in this whole thing. So how did it feel? What did I, what did I sense uh, when I quit smoking? You know, um, I used smoking to celebrate my life. And when I would go to the grocery store to purchase my food, uh, when I got in the parking lot, I would light up a cigarette. And it was a celebration of the event that was about to happen, going into Vons. And you could smoke in the supermarket in those days, you know, and you'd be smoking and you'd just throw your cigarette butt on the ground and squish it out next to the cantaloupe, you know. <laughs> and it was just an odd, you know, now we look back and you go, how could that ever be? But that's how it was. And then um, after I purchased all that I needed to purchase, then I would have another cigarette, celebrating the fact that I had completed the task and done it well. And then I would get in my little car and drive to my little apartment and when I took all the groceries from the car to the apartment, I would have another cigarette and celebrate the fact that they were now in my apartment. So I would celebrate a few TV shows that evening. <laughs> and, and then before I went to sleep, I'd celebrate the fact that I was going to sleep. And I'd end my day with a cigarette. And then I'd wake up in the morning and I'd celebrate the fact that I woke up and have the first cigarette. So you can imagine how eventful my life was and how difficult it was to let all those events, those daily events, go. And and what took its place was a process, was a flow. In the old days, you know, go with the flow. And in all these Buddhist texts like Siddhartha, they always there was like a river or a stream, and the Zen master would come down and look in the water and realize he couldn't put his foot in the same water twice. And then the abbot would come down and say, you couldn't even put your foot in the same water once. And everybody would just look at the water. And so I was looking at the stream of my life for the first time without all the events that I created. Because life has no events. I know it's hard to believe we're getting ready for July 4th, which is like a really big event. And we're going to celebrate by making a lot of noise and drinking. And, and the fact that we created a, a nation. And, and isn't it wonderful? And then everybody wakes up with hangovers the next day. And, 
And in this celebration, we come together as Americans, whatever Americans are. And, and it's nice. It, it gives us a community feeling and it gives us a chance to be connected. And then the next day we go our separate ways. So as I looked at this process that was evolving out of the events of my life, I started to see that there was no beginning and there was no end. And that, that it was sort of mediocre. It was sort of boring not to have all those events to celebrate, like going to the supermarket. And my physical and emotional response was one of anxiety and anticipation and enthusiasm and excitement. Do you know? It was just, and I wanted to, I wanted to do something to mark that, and now there was nothing to do. So I had all this energy building up. And, and it reminded me of uh, later, many years later, as I care for the cats and, and actually have cared for some of them in their dying process and watched them die, that there's a moment of just this wonderful peace and then there's this, these tremors go through this little body. And then finally the last breath is gone. And there's stillness. And, and as I was looking at my, the, the process of letting go of my smoking, I would get into these places of peace, and then this, these little tremors would come. And the tremors were this guy that was going to die, the smoking guy. He was dying. And these little tremors were just going through my body and through my mind. And, and, and I didn't realize at the time, but I really needed to be kind and, and, and forgiving because he didn't want to die. He didn't really even want to come into existence. But at the age of 14, I sort of forced him to come into existence because it was cool to smoke. You know, all my peer group, you know, everybody was smoking and I wanted to be cool. And, and it took a long time to really appreciate smoking because you, it would irritate your eyes and your nose and you'd cough and you'd smell bad, you know. <laughs> and then finally, it was just sort of who you were. And then it went to, okay, I created you, and now I'm going to destroy you. And I never told him why, but he wouldn't have understood anyway, because I didn't understand that I was dying into somebody new. I was dying into somebody who was going to be 30, and who had no future other than death to look forward to, because people over 30 died quickly, and you couldn't trust them. Never trust anybody over 30. Now it's going to be one of those guys you couldn't trust. Now at 66, I don't trust anybody over 85. <laughs> and if I'm lucky enough to make it there, I'll, I'll know why. You know? So, to put this into a context, and to put in, in, into a, in maybe a, a, a metaphor that we can understand, I was lucky enough at the beginning of this month, to be invited to speak at the 10th annual Whitehead Conference on the Ecology. Now, I had given a talk at Pilgrim Place, which is in Claremont, and this is a, a retirement community for really smart and religious people. And I was invited to give a talk to those who assembled for the talk, and then I was invited to have a buffet lunch with everybody. And so... Uh, the lunch was pretty good, and the thing that sort of tripped me out about the lunch is you had to put on these plastic gloves because you had to reach into the salad thing. And so I, all these people had these like, plastic gloves as they reached into the salad. And in line was a, a man named John Cobb. And John Cobb is known as being really smart, and, and, and he sort of helped create this community of process theologians. Now, process theology is something that came out of Alfred North Whitehead's philosophical model that includes everything. Now, he was born like in the late 1800s and died in the 1950s, I think, as I recall. And his goal in life was to have a philosophical model that includes everything in the whole universe. And maybe Einstein wanted to do that, too, mathematically, to include everything. 
And he published a book called Process and Reality, which is available and really difficult to read because what he did is he took language and he gave the English language in certain words an expanded meaning. So you had to sort of re-understand the words that he used and the way he used them to sort of get into his model. Meeting John Cobb, he, John Cobb said to me, would you like to be part of our next Process Theology Conference? And I said, sure. And then I figured out I didn't know anything about Process Theology. And now I had to speak for an hour and a half on something I didn't know. So three books later, I had this sort of model in my head of what it was all about and how I was going to connect it to Buddhism and how I was going to connect it to the ecology. So my talk was Buddhism, the ecology, and process theology. A profound talk. <laughs> and and I, I thought to myself, okay, you know, uh, and this is the first time they've actually invited Buddhists to have a, a, their own section in this conference. So they had various Buddhist speakers to come in uh, along with all the other speakers, and people from all over the world flew in to Claremont, California to attend the Process Theology Conference. So in the group I spoke to, we had seven. I'm thinking, wow, the Buddha had five when he started. I got seven. <laughs> and so I gave my talk and I recorded it. And because I figured if I only had seven in real life, I could have much more in virtual life through iTunes podcast. And it sort of turned out to be that way. So a lot of people have heard what I've said. And, um, and so let me just fill you in just a smidge on this process theology stuff. Okay, we have process. Oh, that's a good one. The end of the world is coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're still coming. So, Alfred White Northhead, uh, Alfred North Whitehead said that there are no events; that everything is in process, everything is in a constant state of becoming something else. And Buddhism sort of says the same thing when you get into a Nietzsche impermanence: that everything is always in a constant state of becoming something else, and never achieves it because as soon as it gets close to becoming something it now starts to become something else. What Whitehead did, I thought was fascinating, is he said, in this process we have cause and consequence, which is like karma. So we can, to a certain extent, predetermine what's going to happen next by doing something now. Because those certain things now have a consistent outcome. But that but he didn't want to say that our life was predetermined or the universe was predetermined. So he said there's also an aspect of novelty that's connected to this cause and consequence. And the novelty is the possibility of something new happening that hasn't been predicted. Okay, so you can do the same thing a hundred times and have the same outcome. And the hundred and first time, something else happens. And you just go, wow, how could that happen? It never happened before. But that's the joy of reality, is we haven't got a clue what's going to happen next. We just think we do. So this unfolding of cause and consequence and novelty is simply a process that perhaps has no beginning and perhaps has no end. And he wanted to include everything, so he included God in the process. So God does not stand apart from the process which sort of bummed me out, because I like to think of God in the throne with the staff and the beard, standing apart, condemning me for everything I think, say, and do. But I came from a Lutheran background, and that's what God did. Now, if God is part of the process, then he is one of the conditions, or she is one of the conditions, or it is one of the conditions. As are we. We are all one of the conditions necessary for everything to happen. So Whitehead said, not only are we in process, but we are in relationship. That the relationship we are in creates the process. Buddhism says the same thing. All things are conditional. All things are interdependent. 
and interconnected. And conditions come and events occur, but not events, a process occurs. So now I'm thinking to myself, how can I make all this into why we get attached to stuff. So this is my little story of attachment. That we have this process, this stream, that just continues, and all of a sudden we create an event. We create an event because of attachment or aversion. See, those are the two event creators. Now we have attachment, and we have aversion, and we have indifference. So indifference generally doesn't create an event for us. We don't even recognize it. But when we are attached to something, we go, whoa. When we have aversion to something, we go, ah. And it seems to me what we do is we reach our hand in the stream, pull out the water, and create an ice cube. A fixed, solid thing out of the process and we give it a value an attachment value or an aversion value and we stick it in our refrigerator and we sort of keep it there and the older we get and the more events we have created for ourselves in our life the bigger our refrigerator gets and the more baggage we carry with us because all these events are defining us in a process that is ever-changing and never starts and never ends. So all these events in our life are who we are. Now, I was invited at the end of May to go to Gethsemane, which is a monastery in Kentucky, and be part of a conference called Gethsemane Four, where Buddhist monks and nuns and Catholic monks and nuns gather and the topic was spiritual maturation. How does it look when you've been doing your practice over a period of years or decades? How have you changed because of that? And we were going to share our experiences. So my talk was getting old with rites and rituals. I thought it was a clever way to describe what I was about to say. The nun who was in charge said to me, I've asked a monk to introduce you. This was being filmed for a documentary, an hour-long documentary that will be viewed in Europe on their public television stations, and it might get over here as well. So we had a French film crew recording (laughs) video and audio and we would give our presentations, and it was nice to have an introduction so we could be defined for the people who may or may not watch this documentary. And I said to the nun, "Uh, I don't want an introduction. And she said to me, it figures. (laughs) Now, I was one of maybe two urban monks there, and the rest were sort of community monks. They actually lived in monasteries and convents. They probably don't call them convents anymore. And they were, they had an extended family. These were their brothers and sisters. And I, on the other hand, and I'm, yeah, I'm an independent contractor. I live in a meditation center. Our community consists of an abbot and a few cats and people that live there. Not quite the same. So I have this sort of independence about me that caused the other monastics to feel a smidge uncomfortable. And the Catholics especially, because the Catholic vow of obedience didn't apply to me, that's for sure. So she allowed me not to have someone describe who I was. I find that to be important in what I do. Because if I am introduced in a certain way, then people have expectations of the way I will manifest before them. And I don't know how I'm going to manifest before them because everything I ever do now is always the first time. I can't rely on habit patterns in the way I used to. 
I can't even rely on saying the same talk twice in the same way because I'm different and the audience is different and therefore the talk will be different. And all the things I've done, which surprise me as I look at my online bio, wow, I have certificates and thank yous and, you know, I've done this and I've done that and I did this for 10 years and this for 12 years and what a guy. And then I show up. You know, and if, it, if they're not disappointed when they see me, they will be after they hear me speak. <laughs> so I prefer to surprise them. <laughs> and just let it unfold naturally. Now, I have created a system to really impress people, and I'll share it with you. If it's a big event, if it's on stage, I start with my ukulele. I pull it out and I play a couple original Buddhist songs. I don't play well. I don't sing well. Their expectations are low. (laughs) Then I give my presentation. And sometimes with enough rest and reflection, I can be eloquent. And sometimes it's a bit impressive to them, the fact that I can still remember my name after all these years on earth. And I just sort of lay it out. And then the finale, I reach for my harmonica. Now, this is a special harmonica. It doesn't have ten holes. It only has six, which leads them to believe it's much harder to play with six holes than ten holes. And I blow them away with a blues melody. I only know one, but this one is good enough because it's the only time they're going to hear me play. And then I get the standing ovation. Not because of the ukulele, not because of the Dharma talk, but because I could play a six-hole harmonica for two minutes and sound good. That's how I impress people. And then I leave, and all they talk about is, I didn't know monks played harmonicas. (laughs) So... I have this ice box filled with ice cubes. We have the red ones and the blue ones, thanks to the matrix. And we have the aversion. (laughs) We have aversion and we have attachment. So, when I turned 29, I wanted to get rid of one of those attachments. How do you do it? How How do you get rid of those ice cubes? And I thought to myself... In putting together this talk, what you do is you bring the ice cube outside so the sun can shine on it and melt it. And so the metaphor of the sun shining on the ice cube could be, I'm going to let my awareness shine on my attachment or aversion without any kind of critical analysis. And I am going to be patient as I focus my awareness. Because I don't know how much time it will take for the ice cube to melt, simply because of the awareness. Patience. Patience is a virtue, seldom found in men, never found in cats. (laughs) We don't know how long it's going to take. I just watch it. And now my physical self is going through all sorts of gyrations because it's getting rid of the chemical addiction and it's also dying and then there's the emotional self that was created by me and now I'm going to have to kill it so I can be the next person the person who doesn't smoke finally my patience turns into acceptance that I'm able to accept the fact that I was a smoker past tense and that I will always be a smoker at some level, that even years later, this desire arises. It's a fascinating thing. After not smoking since 1978, I still have the desire sometimes to smoke, but it only lasts for just a moment. It's like a puff of smoke. What I need to do at that moment, though, is focus my awareness on that desire, Because I have found in my life I am most susceptible when it fools me or sneaks up on me 
and attacks me, these desires. So if I'm, if I'm healthy, if I've had enough sleep, if I have my awareness in place, it arises, I look at it, and I smile. And I say, my old friend smoking, how are you? And it goes away. The first year it took days to go away. The second year it took hours to go away. Now it just takes moments to go away. So letting go for me was an entire process of mind and body using focus and patience to simply watch this arise and not identify it as me arising, but simply identifying it as the process arising. Okay, so this is a dramatic example of letting go, but there are all sorts of things. Now, there was a TV show called What's My Line? And it's on again. And there was this fellow, and his name will come to me, that just fascinated me. I, I just couldn't figure out what he did, why he's on the panel, why he was so clever. And, and so I went online, and of course now with Google, all you have to do is you know, Google the name, and bang. And then I went on YouTube and saw some interviews of him later on in life. And the only thing he ever talked about in every interview on every channel that he found himself on was his ex-wife and how bad she was and how she was going after his money. And she would go after him even after he was dead to get every penny she could. And he could not let go. It ruined his life. My father would talk about my mother in somewhat the same way. The man's name was Henry Morgan, just came up. Probably before everybody's time. But my father would talk about my mother in just terrible ways. He could not let her go. They had been divorced for years. Couldn't find the focus or the awareness or the sunlight to go to the next place in his life. And I think that's what Buddhism has really done for me. It has allowed me to talk and understand the idea of vertical schizophrenia. Now, I talked about this before. I'll just talk about it quickly again. Ram Dass, in one of his best talks, talked about himself suffering from vertical schizophrenia. <coughs> and... As Richard Alpert, he was a psychologist and a professor at Harvard University, and they were doing research with LSD, and he got fired, and he went to India, and he found a guru, and he became Ramdas. Great spiritual teacher. But sometimes he found himself a little bit feisty, and he would invite people up to his room to look at his spiritual paintings, you see. And he realized it wasn't Ramdas who was inviting these people up to his room to look at the spiritual paintings. It was Richard Alpert, who had materialized, who was a little feisty and wanted to make some new friends. As we evolve from who we used to be to who we are to who we're going to be, sometimes we regress, sometimes we go back and we find ourselves in habit patterns that are familiar for instance, visiting your family. Hard not to be that family. Even if you haven't been home in 20 years, all it takes is a few hours, and it's like you never left. So, we have all these people we used to be that need to be honored. Sometimes we need to give them a memorial service because they were trying the best they could and didn't do a very good job of being us. But they could have been young. They could have been deluded. They could have been anxious to become someone and stepped over a lot of people. And only with hindsight and wisdom do we see that that person did the best they could at that time, and we are so happy they are no longer on earth. That they are dead. That's the person you were when you were nine, or 14, or 22, or 30. All those pictures in your photo album to remind you of who you used to be. 
and now we're in the present moment, and we are nobody because we are becoming the next person we're going to be. See, we're not anybody right now, which gives us a whole lot of freedom because everything is a potential. We can be anything we're, we want to be as long as we are not defined in a specific way. So I gave a talk, a keynote address at a graduation last month, my first invitation. It was to eighth graders who were going to high school. And the families were assembled, and the kids, and I brought my harmonica because I knew that would be my closing salvo. And, and I said, in eighth grade, it's okay not to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. That gives you permission to do anything you want to. If you are so focused in eighth grade at being something or someone, you may miss the opportunity to be what you really want to be later, or could be later. Okay, so parents like that, kids could care less. But it's, it's you know, they were kind and courteous. I must say that the young people, this was a private school, that's why I was invited, and, and they were really smart. I mean, so smart. And each one of them gave a little presentation about leaving their home, this school, and going into the great unknown high school. So I, I just, I was fascinated by, by these young people who were so bright and, and, and well-educated. And, and they were about to start a new chapter in their life, high school. And of course, after high school, that new chapter, if they're lucky enough, will be the university or the workforce, whatever they choose to do. But I saw that I had been in that place. I had identified years ago as the eighth grader going to high school. I was scared. I didn't know what to expect. Now, at my current age, I'm excited because I don't know what to expect. Every day unfolds in a magical way. Hard to determine exactly how it's going to end. But if we are engaged in the process of our life in our daily activities, it simply is the flow of what we're doing. And then all of a sudden, have you noticed if you find somebody that you like or dislike and they come into your day, all those ice cubes start rattling in the refrigerator? And you pick one out and go, yeah, I remember. I remember. And then you have to let that go. you got to melt that ice cube. Aging allows us to do it at a much easier level and pace. Now, yesterday I was at Leisure World giving a talk to the Buddhist club, the Buddhist circle. And this woman hadn't seen me in 10 years. And she found out I was giving a talk at Leisure World and she, Leisure World, and she came to hear me talk. She says, do you remember me? I said, no. Have we met before? Oh, yes, 10 years ago. I listened to one of your talks. It was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to remember who I was 10 years ago. The fact that I couldn't remember who she was didn't bother me a bit because it gave me a chance to meet her again for the first time. Because over the 10 years, I have changed, and she has changed, and we are two brand new people. And if she expected me to do what I did 10 years ago, she was going to be disappointed. So I'm happy she reintroduced herself, and we could start fresh. It's sort of nature's way of allowing us to let go of who we used to be and all those memories of those past events that we have edited, given life to, formed into an ice cube, had a like or a dislike, and pushed away for future use. So I'm assuming at some point, as we continue our practice, we will come to the present moment experience of just being here now. And when you're just here now, as Ram Dass probably said years ago, you don't have all that old stuff to pick from, you don't have all that new stuff to anticipate. You are simply manifesting right now. At some point in my talk yesterday, one of the women, women said to me, can you repeat that? That was really good. I said, no, I can't. 
because I don't know what I said. But I'm taping it, I'm recording it, so you can listen to it again, and you can tell me what I said. But isn't that the present moment experience? Have you ever seen a jazz musician playing his instrument? He doesn't know where he's going next, and he doesn't know where he came from. He's just there. And this stuff is just flowing through him. And he has figured out a way to stand aside for a few moments to let this miracle of creation occur. It must be really hard for him after the concert or the song to accept the praise for how well he did it because I'm sure he realizes he didn't do it. That his years of practice and commitment to that instrument allowed the instrument to play itself. And he was just there as one of the conditions in the process of music occurring. But people who are excited and want to give praise need to identify with the event of him. He's the event. And the process of music was turned into an event because of the audience and because of the attachment and the like. Another ice cube was formed. Can we get rid of all these ice cubes, attachment and aversion? Yes. Can we reference them? I think we can still use them to our advantage if we don't identify with them as being us. That they were simply a, events that we created out of a non, out of a process that has no beginning and no end. And these events gave us a reference point that allowed us to redefine ourselves over and over again to ultimately become the person we wanted to, and after that, no person at all. There's a Zen saying, knowledge is learning something every day. Wisdom is letting go of something every day. So the first half of our life, we are learning something every day. And perhaps if we're lucky enough, the second half of our life is we're letting go of something every day. And ultimately, when we leave this place, there'll be no footprints left behind. Huh. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there and ask if anybody has anything they'd like to say. Yes, sir? I just wanted to <coughs> that there are some things, uh, ice cubes, to use your metaphor, that we, we create, some things that we learn, that we take in, and some things that are are created by severe trauma that we need to let go. They are not ice cubes, but they are blocks of ice that may not melt before we inspire. How, how do we let go of those? How do we work with someone who is letting go of those? Yeah, yeah. I would say, uh, uh, in, in a, for a simple uh, answer, would be uh, patience and kindness that we really need to be kind with ourselves because we don't know who we are, ever. We think we do, and that idea of who we are is oftentimes reinforced by family and friends. But if you take ten people and put them in front of an event, each one will have a different take on that event. We have our own world located deep inside of us. The Buddha said, this entire world, and he's not speaking about just us, but everything in this world exists in this fathom-long body. This fathom-long body. Everything in the world exists inside of us. So, trauma, absolutely. You know, you, you, you feel, at least I feel sorry for all those guys who joined the National Guard to help and serve and protect their community and ended up in Iraq or Afghanistan for two years. And they come back and they were just, you know, accountants with a family. And they come back and now the rest of their life, that stuff is going to be rattling through their head and creating emotions they can not control. How do you get past that? I, I think the idea is, again, in an overly simplistic way, is to kill the person in the same way I killed the smoker and gave birth to the non-smoker. 
We have to kill them. We have to give a memorial service to them. We have to say they did the best they could. But something else will come out of that. And it may not be totally healed or whole, but it may give us a chance now to work on that person. And then we kill that person metaphorically, and the next person comes. And we may not have enough people left in our life to fully get rid of all those blocks, if you will. We, you know, if, if we start at 20, we may have a, a, a lot of years ahead of us. If we start at 65, 70, how many good years do we have to get rid of all those people? You know, um, the Buddha and, and Buddhist teachers oftentimes encourage, you know, anybody who hears the Dharma, start today practicing. Don't wait until you're in the hospital, in that bed, before you get your first practice session in. You're not going to have enough time. It takes time to do all this stuff. If you recognize the fact now, in your youth, 20s and 30s, or 40s, <laughs> or 50s, you can still, you still got enough time. You still got enough time to make a difference. So it's, it's metaphorically killing the person, and giving rebirth to the next person over and over and over again, always in a constant state of becoming that person, that next person. We're not sure if it's going to be a better person or a worse person. That's weird, too. And in karma, Buddhism talks about all those people we've used to be, all those people we've killed and slaughtered and were unkind to, and now we're reborn, and we can't remember any of that bad stuff. And in this life, we've been really, really good. And yet, nothing goes the right way for us, and we have a terrible life. So there's no guarantee that the person you kill is going to be worse than the person that's reborn. And that's the chance we take. So how can we hedge our bets? How can we make it better for us? This is going to sound really strange to a secular Buddhist, but the five precepts is where it all starts. You get those five precepts, you look at not killing, not stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no consuming intoxicants. You start there. That builds merit. Merit because you, now you're creating someone in a community that's beneficial and reduces suffering rather than increases suffering. That will help you in your next rebirth, not a lifetime away, but tomorrow. Then you have this meditation, this, this, this cultivation of mind, if you will. And what do we want to cultivate? We want to cultivate generosity. We want to cultivate compassion. We want to cultivate wisdom. That's sort of the goal. And as we cultivate those aspects... What we find is, is we are manifesting in a more skillful way, a more wholesome way, every time we open our mouth or do an activity. Eventually, our mind starts to think in a certain way. I've got a family member who likes to gamble. I talked to him today. He said, I've decided the best way to stop gambling is to buy a boat and go out to sea, where no gambling is available for me. And I said to myself, but you know what? If you get a Wi-Fi signal and you have a computer, you can gamble on the boat. <laughs> so rather than trying to change the world by buying a boat, why don't you change yourself so you can be anywhere you want to be and not have to be drawn in? It's one of those kinds of things. We can, we can make it harder to access which allows us to feel more skillful, or we can change ourselves to be in any environment and not be attached or averse. And, and again, it comes with the five precepts, the cultivation of generosity, compassion, and wisdom. And miraculously, you start to become the next person in a long line of people. That's what I would say. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. So, I guess the question that um, <clears throat> I've been practicing for a couple of years now, I was in the UK recently, and I had an hour and a half where I didn't have a thought except the recognition of that I wasn't having any thoughts or any noise or any 
voices in my head telling me this is not work for the first time in my life. And I realized that I had created some goals for myself, and, uh, and I had actually, uh, I guess, reached one. And, but the result of it was uh, a great deal of depression afterwards, and uh, recognition that just that, that noise had um, obfuscated everything else that was going on in my life that whole time. Um, so I think what I was thinking about asking you is, is, is when we're letting go, I don't know, maybe non culture we think of letting go as like, okay, we let go of this, and, and then there's space there, and it's gone. And my experience of really letting go is that there's always something else there afterwards. It may not be under the same title, block, but... Uh, I think it's called life. There's always something next, you know, until we die. And there's probably always something next after death as well. What, what you said I really in, like about the fact that you, you, you make these goals, you know, and, but the person making the goal will not be the one who achieves them. So you've got that disconnect between those. And then how many people in between? You know, before the final person reaches that goal. And then the goal itself is an illusion because it's just another step in becoming something else. So the event never takes shape, it never forms in any satisfying way. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people who have really focused on success and look at money as being the measure of success, and they get all the money, and they never have enough money. You know, you would think a million, two million, if I had that, that would be enough money for me, but it seems that if that's your goal, to be successful and to have money, you never have enough. So there's a certain sense of, of uh, discontent in that model, of, of wanting to be somebody or something else, rather than coming to this present moment and saying, this is what I have to work with. And all the voices in my head right now are happening because of past or future, but not because of right now. This is, a, this is fertile ground to create the next event in my life. And that event is just a continuation of the process we call our life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I realized when I got to that point where it was, okay, I have this hour and a half of not thinking about the recognition of not having that noise in my head, that it immediately became something else. Was it immediately supplanted by, oh, well, this is the next year? Yeah, yeah, and then, and then we die. That's human life, I suppose. You know, I, cats maybe go through a similar, but not as, you know, sophisticated and dogs, maybe less than cats. <laughs> just because dogs seem more simple than cats. But it's, it's just so fascinating how our culture sets us up for failure. Because, you know, go to school, get a good education, get a good job, have a great relationship, you'll be happy. And blah. So the family member I talked to, I said to him, I said, well, the... The reason you're probably gambling and maybe drinking a little bit too much is because you're seeking happiness, you know? And it makes them happy, but there's a really big payback to, be, to have your happiness created in that way. And, and maybe we can, you know, fine-tune it. I just posted an article on my Facebook page that a lot of people talked about, and, and the part of the article that I liked, nobody said, seemed to say anything about. And the part was that meditation doesn't generally lead to happiness. It leads to peace, which some people think is happiness flatlined. And, and, and so I'm thinking to myself, yeah, in, in selling retreats and selling techniques, in selling Buddhist meditation, we say, if you really want to be happy, this is the way to do it without money or drugs. 
you know, and all you have to do is go on retreat and you'll be happy. The retreats I've gone on, I have been the most unhappy of it because all this stuff at a subconscious level becomes available to me. And I realize for the first time exactly how screwed up I am. And now I've got weeks and weeks of sorting and filtering and making sense of it and rationalizing before I come to the place where I was before I went on the retreat. After years of that purging, it really is a purging, and, and bringing all this stuff into the light of day, I realize I have a greater level of acceptance with myself than I ever have had before. But it didn't come out of being happy. It came out of being frustrated and not knowing and feeling almost victimized by, by my mind and looking at my mind as the problem. But it's not a problem or a solution. It's a function. It's a function that occurs when you have a body and it, we have a human view of the world that allows us to feel certain things in certain ways that no other animal can feel. And with that comes the responsibility of seeking good mental health. But nothing in our culture seems to point us in the direction of good mental health. It seems to point us in the direction of more desire, more craving, more ways to satisfy it by brand new companies that are arising all over the globe who feel sorry for us because we're suffering in so many ways and make all these wonderful products available so we will end our suffering in a commercial way. How wonderful. And if we can turn off a few of the screens, if we can watch a little less TV, what we start to see is is our life is pretty special without all that stimulus. And, and, And it is a miracle that we are all still here. You may not think about it, but last year they had 20,000 hit and runs in Los Angeles. 20,000. We were not one of those 20,000. How lucky are we? We should give praise every day, thankful that we are still here and have the opportunity to become someone else over and over and over again. And then, being a Buddhist, when we finally do die, we get to come back again. Aren't we lucky? (laughs) And go through the whole process one more time. So, the voices in the head, I I have those too sometimes, and I listen to them less and less. They're They're just sort of telling me what they'd like me to do, maybe what I should do, what they think, you know, is important. And if I can just have this choiceless awareness of the situation I find myself in, oftentimes the correct response arises. Not the correct reaction, because that comes from a habitual pattern that's been in place for a long time. But But the correct response coming out of the present moment experience of my life. And who's doing that? I don't know. But I don't think I need to know, as long as it's based in generosity, compassion, and wisdom. Thank you. And with that, I think we'll call it a day, a quick loving-kindness meditation for all the people in our life, in our community who are suffering today, which is everybody. May those of us who have come together today in mind and heart Be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May no problems come to us. May we always find fulfillment. May we also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May the suffering ones be suffering free, the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, may the sick find health relief.